Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm David Coe, and I am the CEO of Calm. I hope everyone is well rested for this panel uh, as we dive into the gift of sleep. And if you're not well rested, you'll learn some of the techniques on how to get well rested. Um, as many of you know, uh, sleep is a critical pillar to our overall health. And good sleep can help us in so many ways, whether it's from our chronic disease to support our overall immune function, for emotion uh, regulation, mental health, and so much more. Yet, as we all know, one in three adults say they don't get enough sleep. As many as 70 million Americans today suffer from some form of insomnia, narcolepsy, sleep apnea, and other sleeping challenges. But today, with this esteemed panel of sleep experts, we're gonna go and dive deep into how cultivating those right habits can improve the quality and quantity of your sleep and how that can align in terms of your shut eye with your body's circadian rhythms. This conversation, I'm really excited today, is gonna to be hosted by Jeff Ronan. He is the chairman and CEO of Paragon Biosciences. Jeff here has spent his entire career focused on advancing science to address the critical unmet needs for patients. And he has been known for developing a record number of novel neurological medicines today. So please welcome me in joining our esteemed panel today. Thank you very much, everyone. Hey, thank you. Well, it's great to be here, and, and I'm really excited about the topic today. Because it's not just a topic that is a personal topic for, for many people. You know, we spend a, a, a very large part of our lives sleeping. Uh, it's, it's been called the foundation of health. We are fortunate to have two renowned experts in this topic that we're going to really dive deep into. And I was, I was asked to make sure we have time for questions at the end. So Julie Fliegers is a, uh, a well-known um, speaker in the area of sleep. She is the founder of Project Sleep and uh, has a great insight and a personal story living with a sleep disorder that she can share with us today. Chris Winter is a, a very well-known sleep researcher and physician helping patients with sleep for many years. He has been studying sleep and doing research since 1993. And we were talking about this earlier. You know, I remember Back in the 90s, they called it the decade of the brain because it was just the beginning. We didn't know much about the brain. Nevertheless, even though we spend so much time of our lives sleeping, we've known, we know very little about why we sleep, the different parts of sleep, REM, non-REM. We are now just starting to understand uh, much more of this, which is why it's such an exciting area. and. and why today is such a great time to be talking about it. So why don't we dive right in. Chris, you and I talked earlier, the, this has been called the foundation of human health. I'm often asked, what's, if I could do one thing to live a better, healthy life, what would it be? My answer's changed. I now tell people it's sleep, sleep eight hours. Can you spend a, a little bit of time talking about why we sleep and why People say it's even more important than nutrition, exercise, in, 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 um, in health. Absolutely, thank you. Um, when I think about health, I think about things that we can modify. When I'm working with a patient, I'm working with an athlete, it's all about what you have control over. And I think that sleep has been forgotten for a long time because it was sort of taken for granted. We get up and we have slept some period of time and there's not really much we can do about it one way or the other. One of the exciting things about sleep is it's moving into the space of being a modifiable health variable. We can control so many aspects of the way we sleep, the way we think about sleep, the things we do in our lives to support sleep. And so when you ask the question, how does sleep foundationally affect our health? it's almost easier to ask the question, how does it not impact our health? I don't think our sleep affects our eye color. 
Outside of that, I'm not sure that there's anything our sleep doesn't touch in our health. It affects weight. It affects cognitive health and performance. Our physical performance, how we perform, either if we're a day-to-day -day exerciser or doing yoga out in a beautiful spot like we did today, or you're an elite athlete. Um, it has to do with your weight, your endocrinological control of your blood sugar. Everything that we do as a human is foundationally supported by sleep. And you see that because when you take away sleep from an organism, we don't do this much anymore. This was in the primitive days of sleep research. But when you would actually sleep deprive organisms, it, was, it created a complete collapse of the body and a death faster than if you were to starve an individual. So to be focused on health and to be focused on you know, living your best life, to leave sleep out, you know, like a lot of people have done in the past, is really missing probably the most important thing that we can do to lead a healthy life. So then, then why, if it's so important, cardiovascular, your immunity system, your, your mental health, anxiety disorders, et cetera, why is it people aren't, when you go to your doctor, why is this not addressed more? Why is it not worked on more often? Why is it not studied more? So I'll give you, a, it's a great question. It's because we're not taught. So I, I started doing research in sleep as an undergrad, completely accidental. I saw something about sleep and money and biology credit hours and something about breast implants. It sounded kind of interesting. And it turns out we were putting breast implants in little pigs and studying sleep apnea. So it wasn't exactly what I thought it would be. But, but when I got to medical, so years later, when I went to medical school, in the four years that I was there, I got one lecture on sleep. It consisted of a young, uh, older couple talking about REM behavior disorder. When you act out a dream, this guy was acting out the dream of chasing a deer through the woods, and he caught the deer and was going to ram the deer's head into the side of the barn. He woke up with his wife's head in his hands. That was the first part of the lecture. The next was about sleep apnea, and a guy saying that he treated his sleep apnea, the sleep apnea, his golf game got better, and that was the end of the lecture. And the great thing was, the next lecture, I remember this like it was yesterday, was about sexual deviances. You know, men who like had weird fascinations with their partner's footwear. And I remember thinking in the audience during that, like, wow, are we gonna see as much of that as we are that, like sleep and sexual, this is all gonna be part of what I do as a doctor. And so one of the things we have to understand is the doctor that you're seeing for your sleep problem, adult, pediatric, there's a 25% chance they have never gotten any sleep education whatsoever. Top seven complaints you're gonna to bring to your doctor, two of them are, I can't sleep or I have trouble falling asleep or I'm excessively sleepy during the day. 25% chance they've gotten no training to answer either one of those questions. The average doctor's gotten two hours of training. So the answer to the question is, we don't prioritize it even today within the training centers that are churning out new physicians and clinicians. Great, and, and Julie, that, that, that leads right into your experience as a, as a patient with a sleep disorder. How did this, how did it, how was it recognized? How did you identify it? Yeah, so I was in law school and um, I'd been a high achiever in college. I was a division one squash player. I don't know if you guys know what squash is, the sport. They do, okay. <laughs> I'm sure of it. <laughs> so um, always high achieving. Uh, and so I thought law school would be the same. Uh, I was following in my dad's footsteps to go to law school and become a lawyer. And the first year of law school was just a lot tougher than I thought. Uh, and I would be in class and typing notes and um, get so kind of out of it that I would have um, strange words in my notes. I think Brad Pitt made it into my property law notes somehow. I don't know. Um, and I'd go to the bathroom a lot to wake myself up during every single class. So it, honestly, after a few months of law school, I thought maybe I'd lost my willpower somehow. I wasn't sure where it had gone because it felt super important to me to be there, but I just didn't feel like myself. Things weren't connecting. At the same time, I was also having an issue where um, when I would laugh at jokes, my knees started buckling and that Felt strange. The first time I felt that, I knew something was weird with my knees. So I did ask doctors. Um, I asked a doctor about my knees buckling with laughter. Didn't know what that was. Um, after my first year of law school, I went to the primary care doctor at Boston College, and I said I have 
three problems. The first, I think I might have a sleep disorder, and this was because it started to affect my driving. Making it 15 minutes just down the road in Boston to law school, it's not that I fell asleep when I was driving, it's that when I arrived at school one day, I didn't remember pulling into the school, choosing a parking spot. I had, I just didn't remember it, and that really scared me, and for the first time I thought, maybe I have a sleep issue, like there's no more excuses, like who can't drive 15 minutes in the morning? Uh, so I brought that, up is that issue up to the primary care doctor and uh, she wanted to look at my thyroid, my iron levels, suggested depression. I didn't necessarily feel depressed, I just felt out of control though, like something was wrong. Um, I brought up the fact that my knees were buckling with laughter and she thought that might be something strange I would just have to get used to which was strange because it was getting worse and a little bit more scary to have almost collapsing with laughter. Uh, and the third problem, luckily I was a big runner at the time and I had a running injury. So she sent me to a sports therapist at Boston College and the sports therapist actually said, asking me about my knees and uh, I said, well, there's this thing that happens when I laugh. It doesn't have to do with my running. No, tell me about it. So I did and she said, I think that's called cataplexy. So she wrote that word down for me, and I went home and I Googled it and found out that was this muscle weakness with emotions, often with laughter, and that it was found in a lot of people with narcolepsy. And I thought, narcolepsy? I don't have narcolepsy. That's a joke about someone falling asleep like while they're standing in the middle of a... That's not me. That's not... But then I read the real symptoms of narcolepsy and realized excessive daytime sleepiness. Oh my God, that sleep disorder I thought I had. So I kind of lucked into a diagnosis through the sports therapist. Um, and what's interesting about that, I think, and relevant to this, is that once I had made it to a sleep specialist, a neurologist at Beth Israel in Boston, uh, and had the sleep study, he was actually so amazed by the results of my sleep study that he was so excited because he couldn't wait to show his residents how quickly I'd gone into REM sleep and all five of my naps, and this was neurologically so amazing. I was thinking, this is not so amazing. I want to be a great law student, not a great like neurological patient, right? At the same time, it was very validating that something was very wrong. And so here I was with a serious case of a serious neurological illness, and yet I had sort of blended in, you know, um, to a law school environment where everyone was sleep deprived and everyone was tired and same in college. Um, so I think that's just a really striking thing to realize that so much of it was so invisible and, and not recognized. Thank you, thank you. And, and you then started Project Sleep. Will you tell us about the mission and, and why that's so important? Yeah, so after I was diagnosed, um, I started treatment. And it was really only after a few months of starting treatment that there was one night in particular in the Boston College Law Library where I was studying, it was about 9 p.m. And all at once I realized I hadn't taken a nap that day. I hadn't gone in and out of strange fog, brain fog. And um, I started crying in the law library because I felt for the first time what it meant to actually feel awake. I realized that for probably six or seven years, I had a weight sitting on my skull, this heaviness that I'd just gotten used to. Um, and so that's when I started to think how bad it had gotten before I'd even recognize that something was wrong and why had it so blended in? Like how had it become that being tired was so cool and so trendy that this serious case of a neurological illness had just blended in? And I thought, who, how many other people are out there like that? Like how, this has gotta be happening to other people. And it's, you know, once I started learning more about sleep and uh, the research and seeing that Sleep disorders were super common, but often underdiagnosed. Um, and it took, you know, on average for narcolepsy, eight to 15 years to get a diagnosis. And only about 25% of people ever got a diagnosis at all. Often misdiagnosed for schizophrenia, depression, um, epilepsy, all sorts of different things. Um, and so that's when I really became passionate about how can we change the conversation, not only about narcolepsy that's not a joke, but just about sleep in general. Like, why is it that my law school had a 24-hour exam. What do you do in a 24-hour exam? Do you stay up for 24 hours? Do you, you know, um, do you sleep during the time you're half? 
that's just so bizarre. And we were bragging about how little sleep you get. Um, but the science was coming along to show how important it was. And I just love a good challenge. Uh, so, you know, trying to make sleep cool is Project Sleep's mission. Um, and we try to approach it from a few different ways from uh, ground up, training storytellers on how to share their story, creating advocates, uh, patient advocates, and then also some top down, um, you know, systems level approaches through advocacy in Washington, D.C. That's great, so important. And Chris, how hard is it to, to be diagnosing so we, when patients who come in with real, real sleep disorders and people who come in, our society has made sleep or lack of sleep a badge of honor in many ways, whether it's med you know, the way we train residents, met, you said law school, uh, some of the work, the shift work that we do, uh, you know, working in, in certain industries where, you know, someone who's, you know, work at the office at 7 a.m., leaving at 8 was something you promoted people on. How, how, how hard is that to differentiate and how often are you seeing that? We see it all the time. I think that we live in a culture that is excited about sleep, is very interested in sleep. I see a lot of aura rings and, and Fitbits in the audience. But we still do have a culture of rewarding work. And if you're the first person in the office, if you're the first coach at the training center and the last one to leave, you're better. I mean, I still deal with coaches all the time who, when you're sitting in their office talking to them, they've got a cot in the back of their office because that's sort of a mark of, of excellence and, 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 and drive. So we deal with it all the time. I, 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 was, I was a doctor before they enlisted duty hours. So we, would, we could be on call legally every two days. It was terrible. We made all kinds of mistakes. I remember sending all my medical orders in and getting a phone call, you know, page, and it was Gladys from the kitchen, the cafeteria in the hospital saying, why are you sending me lisinopril orders through the pathway to the dining center, because I was so out of, <laughs> so I was so sleep deprived, I had made the wrong phone call. I mean, that was trivial, but we do this kind of stuff all the time. So I think it's very difficult to do it because we also, we, we look at individuals who fall asleep quickly, maybe like Julie, as being the ideal. I mean, why is this a hard diagnosis to make in some situations? Because what do you want when, you are, when, you're, when you're having a kid? You want somebody with 10 fingers and 10 toes and you pray to God they're a good sleeper, right? So if your child is falling asleep all over the place, asking you for a nap, never fusses when they go to bed at night, you've hit the jackpot. This is a great sleeper. It's not until they get into law school that you figure out mm, something's a little wrong here. I was dealing with a major league baseball player who had narcolepsy who would come off the field into the dugout in high school, put his glove on the bench and go to sleep. And nobody really thought, they would just wake him up and it was his turn to bat. And so we look at individuals and the ability, to, I, I call it speed to unconsciousness. Oh, I wish I could just be like that person and fall asleep so quickly. And that is the massive conversation that we have in this country. I've been interviewed, I think, 800 times by media outlets about re things related to sleep. One interview in Prevention Magazine three years ago on excessive sleepiness like we're talking about today. So we're interested, but we need more information and better information about how to really understand true sleep disorders and how to help them. It's still a problem. Great, and, and you mentioned athletes, so this is the other, so there is new research. People are interested because we relate now performance to sleep. Yep. Absolutely. And I'm not a huge sports fan. I work with a lot of sports teams. I don't really care one way about sports. So that it, it, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not, I, got a, I love the ring. I wore it just for you guys. I never wear it. Um, my sons, when I was given this by the Cleveland Guardians when they went to the World Series, they said, you can never sell it, but you can give it to a family member. So my sons, as of, they're constantly fighting over it. Well, you can have X, but, you know, I get the ring. So... Yeah, so I mean, what's great about sports though is that I can talk for the rest of my life about sleep. Nobody cares about a five foot eight sleep doctor that's got a big mouth, they don't care about that. But if Tom Brady says something about how sleep affects his performance or Carly Lloyd or LeBron James, 
That's huge. So I thought, you know, if we really got into the performance aspects of athletes, they'll create the message that needs to be out in the world, a message that I'll never be able to create. In fact, Tom Brady one time mentioned something I said on like a tweet. And my son called me at 3 o'clock in the morning to tell me that. My son has never called me at 3 o'clock in the morning to tell me anything and never will. But that was so important to him that he wanted me to know about it. But that's where we have to get messages out. That's where we can amplify messages about, look, here are the things that we need to think about when it, when it relates to sleep and things we can do as, as non-quarterbacks and non-soccer players to really make our performance as humans better through the portal of sleep. Yeah, I think it's a little strange, though, that our professional athletes, and I think athletes are super important and exercise is important, but isn't it a little bit strange as a culture that our professional athletes are actually taking sleep more seriously than doctors who often perform life and death decisions on a daily basis? I don't know that it's the doctor's choice, but the system is putting doctors into a choice where they have it. Yes, I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, nobody liked being on call, let's put it that way. When you're, when you're brushing your teeth with antifungal foot cream, <laughs> you're like, oh, there's something really, I should not be touching a human and helping them with any medical problem at this point. Right, but as a patient, would you prefer your professional athletes to be well-rested or your doctor? So the systems may be a little broken. Right, and, and that part of that is the misperceptions we've had or lack of education about sleep. And Julie, you know, it, it, it is not just a personal issue. These are issues that affect our public policy, our life. I, I believe drunken driving is only one-fifth as, as often an issue as drowsy driving. 500% mm -hmm. more drowsy driving accidents than drunk driving, yet the education dollars spent are 1%. And as a brain, when somebody drives drunk, they know it. They know they're impaired, but they're thinking with a five minute drive, I'm gonna drive really slowly, I can do this. When you drive sleepy, there's much less perception that there is actually a problem. In fact, how many people have fallen asleep and hit the rumble strip and not really felt that they were on the verge of sleep when they hit that? So the perception problem with drowsy driving is huge. And when you combine the two, it's like one plus one equals seven. And a lot of states don't really have great laws to know what to do with individuals who chronically drive sleepy. So it's a very murky area from a legislative perspective. Right, and when you think about sleep disorders in particular, um, so many are underdiagnosed. So it's about one in five people that have a chronic sleep disorder. Um, and I'd say a majority are not diagnosed. So. Let's say 10% let's say of our population is living with an undiagnosed sleep disorder. So I actually looked up the statistics of how many red cars are up there on the road. About 8% of cars are red, okay? So every time you go out to drive next, every time you see a red car, just think that could be a person with an undiagnosed sleep disorder. How do you feel driving? It's not gonna be so great. Uh, and I just think it's so, it's so invisible, uh, and that's why you don't see those things. And, and some of the research that actually made me feel a little bit better about having gone years um, undiagnosed is that even just in healthy uh, adults, they, when you sleep deprive people, um, over f just a few days, people stop being able to recognize how cognitively impaired they are. So you might think you're getting by, and you can just push through something, but actually you've even after just a few days of being sleep deprived, you stop recognize, recognizing how cognitively impaired you actually are. I think that's pretty striking and scary. Right, and that, that cognitive impairment is caused by, it's not even big numbers, it's under seven hours of sleep, right? I mean, you can be affected by, I mean, there's people that think they can get along with five, six hours, many of my friends, in industry think that's normal, but that's, that, that really is not the case, right? Absolutely, no, performance at your best requires sleep. And you know, now we get into sort of aspects of, can you do it on three hours? Well, of course you can, lots of people can. Hospitals and residency programs wouldn't exist if you couldn't. But are you doing the best 
that you can do in those situations? Are you getting what you need for long-term health? Are you accruing a sleep debt that your health will never be able to pay back? I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. I mean, when I looked around medical school, when I got there, I was so lucky to get in. I was like, oh, God, I, can't, I need to you know, get some classes in my belt before they figure out the mistake they've made. So, but I remember looking around thinking, not the most brilliant people in the world. I mean, super smart people, but you know, but wow, could these individuals stay up late? You know, we always called it horsepower. And you're pulling an all-night call and the emergency room won't stop. Like, it was always a conversation. Oh, I was on with Julie. Man, she's got so much horsepower. It was, we really knocked it out that night. But Ben, Ben has no horsepower. Every time we turn around, Ben's asleep at the you know, nurse's station or whatever. And so we reward that. I see that in high school students. But I look at the valedictorian at a high school graduation. Smartest kid? or the one who could sleep deprive herself or their self the most and get ahead. We reward this behavior in our culture for sure. You know? So these are things that we have to sort of reconcile with. I mean, shift work right now is considered a carcinogen. We have huge problems when it relates to sleep and these underlying sleep disorders that nobody really looks at. And, and we sort of go on this idea of I can do it but that's not the recipe for you know, long-term right. health success. Well, I think that's the short-term versus the long-term. You know, in short-term consequences of not getting enough sleep, your cognition, your memory, but long-term, um, you know, things like obesity, diabetes, uh, your, your um, uh, uh, sorry, Alzheimer's disease. So one of the favorite pieces of research was pretty recent, actually. In 2019, um, a group at Boston University we're the first people to actually see this lymphatic system. So when you go into stage three sleep at night, which is the kind of like deep restorative part of your sleep, because sleep is such a fascinating process uh, in general, but here's just one example of how fascinating. When you go into that stage three sleep, um, all of your neurons kind of turn off all at once, which is something your brain can't do when it's awake and conscious. And when that happens, this, um, this fluid rushes through your brain and actually washes out um, this leftover protein that's like you know used up when you're you know thinking during the day, so it's kind of taking out your brain's trash while you sleep. So um, you know I think that's pretty miraculous, and that can only really happen when you're sleeping. And if that doesn't happen, they see that, that these plaque buildup is actually likely linked to Alzheimer's disease. Yep. And so there's a lot more to learn, but. I just think about that, you know, when you go to bed at night, like, you gotta think, like, thank you, sleep, for taking out my brain trash. Because that's not gonna happen during the day, um, and it's just one small example of what's happening at night. Right, during, during REM sleep, it is that restoration of your brain, which is one of the big misperceptions, which is during sleep, you actually improve memory. You actually, so, so even though we think that person is learning more, doing better by staying up at night, the data shows, the recent research, you actually are laying down the foundation for memory, correct? Sure. During that period. You know, a lot of people who come to our clinic with sleep disorders, the first, they're not really coming for sleep disorders. They're coming because they think they're losing their memory. They think they're slipping into some sort of cognitive decline. Um, Sleep is remarkably important, not only in short-term and long-term, for our ability to recall. Tip of the tongue, where did you put your car keys today? Oh, I met that person, their name, their name. Keith? Oh, yeah, Keith. All those sort of subtle mental things. Can you get by without knowing Keith's name during the day? Yes, you can. But all those little things are indicators of deficiencies that you've had in your sleep, and they're really important. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at sort of you know, cognitive performance at your best, you know, that 90 to 100% change. You know, sleep is a huge part of that. I mean, Matthew Walker's research on memory, you teach a little piano, you know, a little piano sequence on a keyboard, and then the ones who would sleep and then do the keyboard the next day would remember it better than the people who didn't. Just little subtle things like that, yet what do we do in college? We're pulling all night or do our art history exam. You know, trying to learn Titian's and Michelangelo's all night long. But we're really working against ourselves, both in the short and the long term, when we, when we think that getting away from sleep is going to get you further than, than, than embracing it. Right. So there, there are, Julie, what, what should we be doing more of to, to educate people, to train people, misperceptions, um, lifestyle changes, 
recognizing disorders? What, what should we be doing more of? Well, just talking about it. You know, I think it's funny, as a person with narcolepsy, um, it's not written on my face necessarily, but I do wear a bracelet. Um, and so if people see that, and once you start talking about sleep, a lot of people are having challenges with sleep. Um, so just being okay having those conversations. Uh, and also, you know, even though I consider myself a sleep advocate, I really wanna actually be like a wakefulness advocate. I don't really care how you sleep at night, but how do you feel during the day? Do you feel rested? Do you feel good? Do you feel like you can control your, your mood and your emotions and your mental health? Um, that's what gets me really excited and, and thinking about some of the change we need to do to think about sleep. It's, it's just, you know, it's not just, you know, making sure you get eight hours. It's, it's making sure that you feel good during the day. And, for, you know, for sleep disorders, like, I didn't think I could have narcolepsy. And there's no way I could have known because actually it's just my brain waves at night um, that really indicate this. So uh, it's important to see a sleep doctor. Uh, as Chris said, you know, most medical professionals, your primary care, the primary care I went to is not familiar with the basic symptoms. So um, we're often trying to get people to the sleep specialist in particular. Yes. Yeah. And that, that's changed, right, Chris? Yeah. It's so much because of technology you used to have to go to a sleep center for everything. Mm -hmm. Now it's a lot less invasive. It's a lot less. Uh, you mentioned the aura ring. I don't have mine, but I do wear it. Um, the, to track your sleep, there's things that can be done diagnostically that we're learning so much more. What, what should we be doing? What, what are those things that we can be doing to improve our sleep, to, to track our sleep? Is, is all that good? Is it useful? It really depends upon the question you're asking. If you're struggling with your sleep today, buying something and putting it on your finger is probably not going to fix it. In fact, for a lot of individuals, it might make it worse because now you're going to bed every night like it's some sort of exam. You know, I hope I get a good grade on my you know, sleep tracker in the morning. And so as you're sitting there waiting to sleep, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm already screwing it up, you know, kind of thing. So if you're that kind of person, that's fine. A lot of type A people are. You, those things may not be particularly helpful. But I think there's a positive side to technology. You know, I was first doing sleep studies back in the early 90s. The technology we used to do a sleep study would not fit in your coat closet. This massive machine with pens and ink and paper that was running constantly, and now all that's been condensed down to the size of a ring, which is incredible. So the consumer interest in technology is really, to some degree, outpacing the medical field when it comes to sleep. So you're exactly right. If you're concerned, okay, your partner snores, you think you hear them stop breathing during the night, they can have a sleep study at home that will be paid for by your insurance, and you can get a auto CPAP set up without ever having stepped foot in a sleep center. So it's become so much easier to get these things fixed and dealt with than, we were, than, in, the, than in the past. So I, I think technology is a great window into our sleep. You and your partner have got matching you know, aura rings. You always score 90, they always score 30. There's probably something there. You know, our field does a good job of sort of disavowing technology, saying it's not as good as a real sleep, sleep study. It's probably not. But it's also something you're wearing every night versus a sleep study you spend one night in a sleep center. So you get this longitudinal data that we can never give you from a medical perspective. So what I would say is, I think Julie made a great point. If I were to ra tell you, are you a good sleeper or a bad sleeper? Raise your hand if you're a bad sleeper. People who raise their hand are going to say they're a bad sleeper because of two factors. Number one, it takes you a long time to fall asleep. Number two, you wake up during the night and struggle to get back to sleep. The best metric for great sleep is how do you feel? How do you feel during the day? We're supposed to wake up during the night. Humans wake up a lot during the night. In fact, a lot of people bring me their tracker data that says, look at this, I woke up 12 times last night. That's below average for somebody your age. Next question. So these things are making us aware of facts that we just don't have the education to go along with. That's always been the, the downside to technology. Great information about your sleep, I don't know what it means. Like showing me an MRI of a, of a knee, like pretty. I don't know. I see some ligaments there. Great. You know, synovial fluid. I, I don't I have no idea what to do with that information. So we're in this sort of wild west of technology and sleep. It's a lot of fun. It's total interest. But what we'll move to next is the real education that goes along with the technology. That's, that'll be the next phase. Yeah, and that's a lot of what Project Sleep is trying to do, advocating, and even being here is so important because this is a public health issue that has been really under-recognized on a federal level, 
um, across you know, foundations. Uh, there's not a lot of emphasis on promoting sleep education. Um, so at CDC right now, there is zero funding dedicated to sleep health, sleep equity, and sleep disorders awareness. Um, at the same time, I just want to mention energy drinks. I don't know, you know if you guys have ever had an energy drink before. They're not very good tasting, so I think we know what the purpose are to wake us up. Um, in 2019, the energy drink industry was an $11 billion industry just in America. And it's predicted to be a $84 billion industry around the world in 2026. That's a really big industry. And um, when you see ads, I got targeted <laughs> for an ad recently uh, from one of these companies. It said, no time for downtime, grab a energy drink. Sleep is not downtime. As I just mentioned, it's things like washing out your brain so you don't get Alzheimer's disease. All these different processes are actually active processes. You're just not conscious for it. So actually, you can't have an energy drink and wash out your brain trash. Uh, so this is a messaging of a multi-billion dollar industry that you can just skimp on sleep and grab an energy drink. Uh, and what do we have to combat that? We have no federal funding right now dedicated to public health, public education, professional education of doctors around sleep. So um, not to be negative, <laughs> but it's a great opportunity. It's what excites me to be out there and trying to change that. So we're trying to um, work with Congress to uh, direct CDC towards developing a, an actual legitimate sleep program to start doing some of this public and professional education. And we really hope to get more public health um, community involved as well. Oh, that's great. It, it's, you know, I think the RAND just came out with the numbers. It's over $400 billion a year it's costing Americans in, in productivity uh, related to sleep disorders. Yep. So it is something we need to address. And before we jump into questions, I, I do have, you know, the, very often people ask, what are the things I can be doing to sleep better? And we talked about Matthew Walker's work, your work, and your, several of your books. In, in what are some of those things? You know, I, I just was with someone yesterday who talked about she can't sleep, so she reads her iPad at night with that radiant light. That's maybe the worst thing. You, that's one of the worst things you can be doing. What are those other things? I think the first thing, if you want to sleep better, is you have to educate yourself. And you have to educate yourself with real, scientifically proven information. I started a podcast exactly a year ago, and it's been so much fun. Once a week, we just pick a topic. We spend you know, half the time talking about the topic, and frankly, the other half debunking what you heard on TikTok. You know, there's real science about sleep, and it's exciting, and it's actually encouraging and empowering. So education is step one. You have to understand that, like we talked about, the big idea to open this thing up. It's impossible not to sleep. It's fun to say that to a patient and kind of see there's sometimes it can be so empowering to somebody. They believe that the cocktail of things they're putting in their body are the reason they sleep. No, it's physiologically impossible not to sleep. It doesn't mean you sleep well, but you're going to sleep. If we all sit here and look at each other long enough, one by one, we will all fall asleep. And it's lovely and, and exciting to do, you know. <laughs> I'll be the last, but I'll, I'll, I'll make sure everybody's taken care of as you fall asleep. So education is the first thing. Number two, seek help early. Everybody knows, everybody in here knows your body better than the doctor or the person that you're talking. So seeking a professional sleep expert's help early on. I've never seen a patient and thought, wow, why did they come so soon? I just diagnosed a guy with sleep apnea who had 155.8, 10 second, bless you, or longer breathing disturbances per hour. Sleep apnea is diagnosed when that number goes above five. He was 155. And the whole time I was, he was a UPS driver, a <laughs> red truck, you'll see him, as Julie said, he's the red truck driving around with UPS on the side. But I, I remember thinking to myself, where has the medical field been as you've developed high blood pressure, you're overweight, you are constantly drinking energy drinks to stay awake to drive your truck. In fact, you probably gravitated towards that job because it's busy, right? Can't fall asleep hanging sheetrock. 
You know, so he's moving his body all the time. But we let him go from zero breathing problems per hour to 155.8 before we intervened. And he was like, you know, he goes, I didn't even know sleep doctors existed. And that's a problem. So advocate for the people that you love. Advocate for yourself. And if your doctor says, I don't think you need to see a sleep specialist, get another doctor. That's great. Well, I, I promised we'd save time for questions. Um, why don't we just start here? I don't know where the... Yeah, great. So excellent talk. Uh, I, I think I have uh, already offline asked many questions. But uh, one thing uh, was not touched here is jet lag. So uh, would you please tell me is there anything works? Uh, because there is not too much research on melatonin. So uh, the dose of melatonin, how many hours before expected sleep we should take, or any other, there are so many gadgets in the market. Any gadget works for uh, jet lag. Yeah. I think if I understood the question, he talked about melatonin. Uh, melatonin has been wildly popular of late. Melatonin is a chemical that we make in our brain that's related to our circadian rhythm. So we have lots of chemicals that regulate sleep. If you took melatonin out of the mix, we'd all sleep somewhere between seven to nine hours on average. But if we went around the room and talked to people about their schedule, it would be constantly changing. So we need something to sort of align our sleep with the 24-hour cycle that we live in. Nathaniel Kleitman and Bruce Richards, uh, if you ever look what an interesting story, spent about 32, uh, 32 uh, days in Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, studying how that worked in, in, in circadian rhythm in total darkness. So melatonin is what's going to align our seven to nine hours with the rise and fall of light. So everybody in here is making plenty of melatonin. However, we supplement it now. So there is research about melatonin in terms of jet lag. You're somebody who's traveling back and forth to Singapore, and you need to align yourself with that time zone quickly so you can give your presentation and get back to New York where you're based. There is research for that. There's also research for people who are shift workers. I work 7P to 7A. I do that for 14 days. And then I go 7A to 7P. And I really struggle when I go from you know, one to the other. Sure, that's what you can use that for. Circadian rhythm disorders, delayed sleep phase. There are reasons to use it. And if you look at the pie chart of people who are using it, that probably makes up about 3%. The other 97%, I take it to fall asleep at night. And the problem with that is, when do we go to bed at night? Go to bed at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock if you watch Succession. Um, so you take your pill when you go to bed at night, right? So you get this surge of melatonin through your brain, maybe, and I'll get back to that. That surge of melatonin is telling you the sun's going down. Well, wait a minute, it's 11 o'clock. The sun's not going down now. The sun went down hours ago, right? So now, as you start to take that melatonin night after night after night, you are actually traveling your body eastward which is hard to travel when you go eastward, right? I'm going to go back to, to Charlottesville, Virginia in a couple of days, and when it's time to go to bed, I'm not going to be ready to go to bed because my body says, no, it's still only 8 o'clock. You're still on Aspen time or you know, whatever. So the problem with melatonin, too, is that studies have come out. There was a Canadian study in 2018 and a, a JAMA study that just came out that said, basically, you have no idea what you're taking when you're taking melatonin, even within the same brand, the same lot. It could be three times as much melatonin in that capsule or none. There was a pediatric brand that had CBD in it that was not anywhere on the label. So it's like saying to me, hey, Chris, how do we use melatonin effectively in our life? It's like asking a chef, hey, I bought some ingredients during this brown bag. What should we make? Until you tell me what's in the brown bag, I have no idea how to answer that question. So what's in the pill that you take? I have no clue. So if we could control for that variable, and had melatonin, sure, you can use it for circadian problems, but if you're taking that every night and saying, Chris, I can't sleep without it, it's a belief. It's not a science. Right. Right. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm Doran Pinnell, and I'm a Duke girl. I know you have Carolina blood in you. <laughs> um, when my son was born at Duke, but I told him he was born at North Carolina. He still believes that to this day. <laughs> My son's doctor who delivered him, his last name was Killam. <laughs> Literally. Um, no, he didn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, when my late husband died, 
I saw an integrative medicine physician, and she helped me tremendously with my sleep. And I still take it today. It's called Cortisol Manager. Would you talk a little bit about that? Thank you. OK. So I'm going to disclaim this. And if you listen to my podcast, you know I really try to stay within acknowledged science. Now, I, the disclaimer, the disclaimer is just because we haven't studied something doesn't mean it's not real. So one of the things that we often deal with as sleep doctors is fatigue. And I define everything under the umbrella of being tired. I am tired. Somebody comes to my clinic, I'm tired. Do you mean you are sleepy? Like when you sit down in a meeting, you fall asleep, you nod off at stoplights, you've fallen asleep during intercourse or Aerosmith concerts. That to me is an unusual and excessive drive to sleep. There's two reasons for it. You're not getting enough sleep, there's something wrong with your sleep. Fatigue is a sense of low body energy. I don't fall asleep. In fact, I lay down and take a nap, I don't fall asleep, but I don't, I don't have the energy to fold a load of laundry. So we get a lot of crossover in terms of those two populations. There's a cause of fatigue for every letter of the alphabet. I said that one time at a lecture, and somebody said, well, name them. I got to J and couldn't figure out a J, but in my new book, I, I, Gilbert syndrome. But anemia, B12 deficiency, COVID, depression, I mean, there's pl plenty of them. So cortisol manager is a non-FDA approved drug. Um, it is a supplement meant to enhance cortisol. So cortisol is a chemical, it's a stress hormone that we secrete in the circ circadian rhythm like just about everything else in our body that prepares us for the day. Cortisol is good. Too much cortisol, not great. Cortisol is a good thing. So there is a disorder that is circulated out there that is often re related to adrenal, they call it adrenal fatigue. They're saying your adrenals are fatigued. And I'll tell you that is a very controversial diagnosis. Because often the way it's diagnosed is, well, I, you know, peed in a container for 24 hours and they diagnosed me as having low cortisol. Um, and so cortisol fluctuates throughout the day and is related to sleep, but not necessarily impactful for it. So what I will say, I'll leave it at this. We could talk about it for a long time. I'm not sure exactly what it is or what it means. The diagnostic criteria are very loose. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so if somebody is taking something that is not harmful to them and they believe that it helps with their sleep, who am I to judge? Great. Um, patients request and doctors always find it easier to write a prescription. Would you guys comment on the available uh, sleeping medications, specifically commenting on the diazepam family and, and mm -hmm. the benzodiazepam family, and lastly, uh, trazodone and how it may be different. Yeah. So, great question. Uh, sleeping pills, that's episode 13. Uh, I want a new drug. I think it was the title of that podcast. So, I like talking about sleeping pills because there's so much misperception about them. So, we can talk about you know, the history of, of sleeping pills. I love collecting old sleeping pill ads. My favorite is from a drug called Nembutal. It's a barbiturate. Um, and it's got uh, a picture of a woman that says, this is a great drug for simple insomnia to manic psychosis. Like whoever shows up at your house and is having trouble, that drug works. And we still use that drug. It's off the market for insomnia, but we still do use it in this country for lethal injections. Um, so, but, so moving from the barbiturates, which you know, sedated people like crazy, um, we moved to the, uh, the benzodiazepines, which is a really interesting history I won't get into. If you're taking a drug that ends in the letters PAM, diazepam, lorazepam, you're, you're taking a, 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 and they're meaningful drugs. They're wonderful for acute anxiety. If you're on a city bus and having a panic attack or heading up the gondola to the top of the mountain and you're freaking out, you know, take a little PAM drug, you're gonna be okay. You know, settle down so you don't leap out the window. But if you're using it for, for sleep, interesting things happen. Number one, it suppresses deep sleep. The sleep that we're looking for makes us feel rested, makes us you know, create growth hormone and look 20 years younger than our stated age on our driver's license. Um, it also creates a lot of amnesia. So when you actually look at data of people taking PAM drugs for sleep, which we don't do a lot of, that, that message has gotten to most primary care doctors. If you're taking lorazepam or clonazepam every night to sleep just for simple insomnia, you're probably doing yourself you know, not such a great favor. That this drug creates an amnesia and a sense of sleep. So when you actually study the individual taking the drug, they don't sleep anymore. In fact, they'll often sleep less, but they will report the next morning that they slept better. 
And what's interesting, it's massively suppressive to deep sleep. It's like alcohol. Alcohol in acute phase can actually increase sleep and maybe even depth of sleep. But once you get beyond your know, chronic use of a week or two, it starts to have very deleterious effects. Trazodone, he mentioned, is the most commonly prescribed sleep drug in this world. The most commonly used sleep drug in this world is uh, alcohol. But the most commonly prescribed sleep drug is trazodone, which has no FDA approval for sleep. It is an antidepressant that, as one of its side effects, causes sedation. So now we're back to exactly what he said. When you go to see your doctor, um, who's not been trained on sleep, and you're saying, I'm struggling to fall asleep, they have seven minutes to deal with you <laughs> or your problem. And so the pill becomes a very simple solution. It's speed to unconsciousness. That's how we're judging sleep. Oh, it takes you, excellent, you know, 20 minutes to fall asleep. I'm going to give you a drug that makes you fall asleep faster. And what's interesting is that a lot of people, I'm sure, in here take sleeping pills. So you don't take my word for it. Go to the sleeping pill website that you take. There's a lot of new ones here. Look at the data. And before you do, write down what you think it's doing. Meaning that I've got patients who say, it'll take me seven hours to fall asleep, but I've got this new pill and it's helping me. Okay, what does the data show about the pill? Probably gonna make you fall asleep three and a half minutes faster if it has any impact on your sleep latency. And you'll sleep an additional maybe 10 minutes a night. I will let you all know when a patient comes to me saying, I'm falling asleep at 1137 and I need a pill that makes me fall asleep at 1133. Got anything? I've never seen that patient before. The patient doesn't exist. So again, sleeping pills, I always tell people, I've never met a sleeping pill that doesn't lie. And what I mean by that is what you think it's doing and maybe what your clinician thinks it's doing is very different from what these drugs actually do. But it's also important to know about cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And oh, yeah, yeah. Well, insomnia is real. Really We're just talking about pills here. I did a whole episode on cognitive behavioral therapy. It is the way we deal with insomnia. If you really want to get out from under the weight of insomnia, you have to adjust your beliefs and your relationship with sleep. And until you do that, you're not going to go very far, most likely. Well, Chris and Julie... We're, we're out of time, but I, I want to thank you. What a great way to end. We're going to have to yeah. follow up with that. Thank you both very thank much. Thank you all.